So the next speaker is uh, Ross Duncan from Oxford University, a joint book uh, on interacting quantum observables. Thank you, Jagash. Okay, so what I want to talk to you about uh, today is some recent results in a long-running program we've had, in, mostly in Oxford, but also in other places, about re quantum theory on a categorical basis. So, why would we want to do that in the first place? An analogy to start with is the theory of, of intuitionistic logic, which is more or less functional programming. And that's a pretty good theory, and we can do some stuff with it. But when we break it down into linear terms, we actually learn a lot more by understanding this in terms of what's happening here, these more primitive operations. So we want to try and do the same thing for quantum mechanics. So instead of having this, this heavy machinery here, we try and move to something simpler. And I'm going to propose to you that an important part of it is just some simple rules about when quantum states can be copied. Okay. So quantum mechanics is a very is a heavier formalism than it needs to be. It has states which are really equivalence classes of vectors. It has things in the mathematics which don't denote anything in physics and so on. So it would be better to clean that up. And what, could, what, what exactly is going on in this Hilbert space formalism that's making really interesting things happen? And the question is that is asked, which other models have those interesting properties? And if you want to do something in quantum computing, maybe you want to model check a program, you would have to reason about quantum mechanics to, to get the correctness of that program. So having models which are simpler than this continuous Hilbert space picture is a good idea. And the calculus that I'm going to show you is sufficiently simple that it actually is much easier to understand <coughs> what you're doing when you're constructing such a program as well. So I don't think I need to say this, but I'll just go quickly. That, uh, so what is quantum mechanics in one slide? We've got states which are unit vectors in a complex Hilbert space, and I'm going to write them in this Dirac notation. So in a two-dimensional space, it's a qubit, one or zero, the standard basis, here's the sum. Okay. Uh, we have a tensor product, and we have some unitary operations. And the thing, that's all the boring stuff. And the thing which makes quantum mechanics interesting is the fact that you have observables which don't commute with each other. So in this example, if you try to measure the momentum, then the better you know the momentum, the more badly you know the position. So the factor and character can escape in this adversary. Um, but we're not going to talk about position and momentum because we're only going to be in finite dimensions. So here's a, an easier example. We're going to talk about spin. And here's a typical quantum state. And I want to measure it's spin with either respect to z or the x um, axis. And so if I do this measurement, what I'm going to see afterwards is one of its eigenvectors, either 0 or 1. And the probability of seeing these things goes with the squares of the amplitudes here. Likewise, when I measure this one, I see some different vectors. I see this, this plus state, which is 0 plus 1. I see the minus state, which is 0 <coughs> minus 1. And again, I have some effect of the probability of space and time of these. So if I actually take my alpha to be 1 and my beta to be 0, I'm already in an eigenvector of this state. So when I measure probability 1, I see 0. Probability 0, I see 1. Okay, and, but on the other side, I'm not in an eigenstate. And actually, I have equal probability for both outcomes. Conversely, if I take both uh, alpha and beta to be equal, I'm already in this state. So when I measure x, probability 1, I see this. Probability 0, I see that. And this one is so this is a phenomenon called complementarity. So you can think of a quantum observable as being a basis on your state space. And obviously there's more than one basis. So there's a green one, you have a red one, if you put the red one over here, it's a different basis again. But when we put it in the middle, then we have this neat effect that the inner product between these two guys becomes equal. So when I measure this vector with respect to these two, I have equal, prob equal probability seeing these other things. And the same for the other vector. And the inner product is equal. So these things are called uh, mutually unbiased bases, and your corresponding observables are called complementary. And so these are incompatible observables in the sense that when this property is as defined as it can be, this one is as undefined as it can if that makes sense. Okay. 
And if you're in finite dimensions, you can see your basis is mutually unbiased. You mean inner product between any any pair of vectors from the, the appropriate bases is given by this over here. Okay. So what I'm going to tell you about in the rest of the talk is how to do this all in a what happens when you axiomatize this in a kind of categorical framework? What does it buy you? So the first thing we're going to talk about is very quickly into monoidal categories, which was already covered in Shinya's talk earlier. Now I'm going to explain what does it mean to do to copy? Because I'll come back to that in a second. And then I say what happens if we have incompatible observables? And when I take this general theory, which is quite high level algebraic stuff, and I make it special to the case of qubits, what can we do there? As I go down here, when I get to the bottom of this, this, this list, I'm going to be able to do quite a lot of quantum computing. So in particular, I'm going to be able to show you how to simulate a Fourier transform just in terms of these pictures. Okay, so here's the, the, the thing. So categories, think of categories as a typed operation. So you have some types, and if the types are matching up, then you could compose the, uh, the operations. And if you compose three in a row, it's associative, so it doesn't matter which way you bracket it. And so that associativity is already in the picture, right? I don't need to do anything to show it. Okay, and we have an identity operation. And if I put something after the identity, it's the same thing as putting it before the identity, the same thing as not having an identity. We have parallel composition, which is this tensor product. And so that means we put things in parallel. And again, it's associative, so you can just write an arbitrary string of things in parallel, and it doesn't matter which way you bracket it. Even better, tensor product is bifunctor, which means it satisfies this exchange law, which you can ignore and just say this picture is unambiguous. Okay, so it doesn't matter if I do the parallel composition or the sequential composition first. And furthermore, the identity operation on a tensor product of objects is just the tensor of the identity. So just two binds. Okay? And in particular, if I've got things in parallel, I can slide them up and down like this. So I'm trying to get to the point where you can, you can understand that if it looks kind of like the same graph, it should be the same thing. Okay, but let me just come back to that in a second. So in the moral category, you also have a special object or unit, which we tensor for something else, you just get the same thing back. And so this diagrammatic notation, which is going to draw nothing for that. It's going to be blank. And so here's an example of a thing that has no inputs and it produces something. So you can think of this as preparing a state or a ket in the direct notation. Here, you have an input coming in and nothing coming out. So this is a bra. As you compose a bra and a cat, you get a number, which is a type from I to I. So in usual examples, the object I will be the underlying field of your vector space. So these scalars have nice properties. The tensor and sequential composition are the same for them, and also they're symmetric. So in terms of our diagrammatic notation, is you can just draw these little diamonds anywhere we like on the page, and it doesn't matter. So if I have some other arrow, I can adjoin this element to give it a scalar multiple. Okay. So it's a symmetric category. So we have this crossing over operation, and if we cross over twice, then it's just the same as doing nothing. And if we put some stuff and then cross the lines over, it should be the same as the lines there. Okay? Okay, so I'm gonna have a little more structure again, symmetric noise categories, so we have compact categories, which means there are arrows which can bend. Okay, and the property that they have to obey is that they should be composed like this, that's just the identity. And if I stick something at the end of that, then I can slide it along the line and that also doesn't matter. Okay? And the last piece of the equation that we want to have, we want to talk about quantum things, we want to have this dagger operation, which is the linear adjoint. So I've got some map here, I represent his adjoint by reflecting it in this horizontal axis. And if I know what what a, a dagger is, what an adjoint is, I can use this to define unitarity. And I'll say that my, my operation is unitary, when I compose it with this adjoint, then that should give me the identity, and on the other side, the adjoint and that thing is also the identity. Okay, and so this is the main theorem. I'm saying this is a theorem. This is a tower of theorems going back to, at least to Kelly Laplace in 1980. But the idea is, I make a complicated drawing like this, and if I could somehow twist it around to get something which is the same, is the same as the thing in graph notation, it's the same thing. And that equality follows by the structure, structural equations of all these categories. Yeah. What do these bend arrows correspond to in like usual quantum mechanics? I'll come back to this in a second. 
Yes. So the uh, so in the usual quantum mechanics, what does all this stuff mean? So the objects, the types are just Hilbert spaces. The arrows are any old linear map. Tensor product is the usual tensor product, and this unit object is just the complex numbers. F dagger is the usual adjoint, and when we have a, an arrow of this type going from i into a, this is picking out because it's linear. It's fixed by its value of one, so it's picking out exactly one vector. So these are the kets, these are the bras, and these are just the, the composition of the ket with the bra. It's just the usual kind of product. And the compact structure, if you look at it here, what you have is this. So this is a map. It took nothing and it goes to two things. You have one and it goes to the, the elements on the diagonal in this space. And the, the, the core one is just projecting onto that. So what this means is that. In C2, in qubits, if I'm taking out this, this bendy map, it's just taking out the bell state, the usual bell state. Okay, so here's a simple example of something we can write down. This looks like a quantum circuit, and it's supposed to be a quantum circuit. So the dots at the top are fresh qubits, prepared in state zero. Then I'm going to compose them with some one-to-one -one operation called H, and then a two-qubit operation I can... I call control X. And I can give all these names to this, but I can't do anything more than just give it names because I don't have any equations to tell me the structure of what's happening here. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to start talking about bases and observables. Okay, so this is classical structures. So in quantum mechanics, we have these theorems. No cloning, no deleting theorem. It says that if you have some state then you can't make a copy of it. Well, if you have two states, you can't copy of both unless you know ahead of time they're orthogonal. Likewise, if you have two states which you can both erase, they must also be orthogonal. So there's no uniform operation to copy or erase arbitrary quantum states. This property is saying they must be orthogonal is telling you that they must be um, eigenvectors of some measurable quantity. So if I promise you that I've got a classical like, quantum state that has some classical property which is well defined, in the state that I can call. And so we think, think about operations which can do uh, this. operations which can do copying, you want to think of this thing which is tied to a basis. So just as an aside, in these diagonal compact categories I'm just talking about, there are no natural transformations of the type that are copying or erasing. So you don't, even at the abstract level, you don't have this uniform notion of copying and erasing. Okay. So what if we don't want a uniform notion? So this is some, some beginning of my syntax I'm going to introduce here. This thing, delta, is a copying operation. It has one input, it has two outputs, and they're copies. This one, epsilon, has one input, no output, it's an eraser. So what you expect us to obey is that it should form a cohomology. What does that mean? It means I copy something, and then I copy one of the copies. It doesn't matter which copy I copy. And if I copy something, and then I erase one of the copies, then I've just got what I started with. And the copy something, these copies are interchangeable. So this is saying that this guy is a community, well, these two together form a commutative cohomology. These ones, the daggers, are just their, their adjoints. So this one is clearly preparing a fresh state, and this one is what's called the fusion operation, this kind of a test. If the same thing comes on both sides, it passes. If different things come, it gets sent to zero. Okay? But I also want the, the adjoints to obey some equations which make them into a monoid. So this is now all the same stuff but upside down. It's category theory. You have to have upside down stuff. <laughs> okay. And furthermore, we want two more equations. First of all, these guys should be a Frobenius algebra. So you, if you think about these things in terms of copying and, and testing, you'll see this equation makes sense. And also, this one of the laws, a symmetry law, which is going to basically squash all the loops out of your picture. Again, if you copy something and test the copies are equal, then it's the same as doing that. Okay. So in a in a Hilbert space, you can define one of these guys by taking your favorite basis in the space and sending this basis vector to the tensor product of itself. And to do an erasing, you pick out some basis with the equal sum of your favorite basis and map that onto one. Okay, and your canonical example of this is going to be taking the zero qubit to zero to zero, one qubit to one one. And the erasing is the projection from the plus state of the one. 
Okay. Notice that that if I put the plus state into my copier, I don't get copied. I get this entangled state. I get again the bell state. So it gives me a little equation in my graphical language straight away. If I have this, this plus state, I try to copy it. I get this. Okay. We're going to use that later. Something else. Right. So the main claim I'm making was that. The classical structures are bases, and this is here in the set. This was proved this year, last year? What? This year or something. Proved this year by Bob, Visco Pavlich, and Jamie Vickery. And this is saying that if you have a classical structure, you're really picking out a basis, you're really picking out a quantum example. And because of all these equations I showed you, I mean that if I have some very complicated graph, it turns out that I can just ignore all the internal structure and just count the inputs and outputs. And so we have what's called the spider result. So I can just, any graph like that, I can just graph out more time. Okay, that was one observable. What happens if we have two observables? But before I get to that, I want to talk about two different kinds of points. So here's my classical structure again, my copying, my erasing. So I'm going to write in a red color with a little i in it the points which can be copied by delta. So here's the equation. I is copied. Um, because we're in finite dimensions, we know this is going to be a finite set. Okay, and the other kind of point I want to talk about is... Oh, yes, this is nice. So there should be some scalar factors here. Everywhere in the top from now on, but I'm just not going to solve them because it just makes things too complicated. Okay, the other kind of point we want to talk about is um, our bias points. Um, that definition looks a little bit more weird. So I'm going to take a little while to explain what's going on with this. But before I do that, let's just note that we already know at least one example of an unbiased point because if I, if I put this, this epsilon in here and I put this epsilon dagger in here and epsilon into this guy, because I know this is a unit for the monoid, I already have at least one example of these kind of points. Okay? So I have got a monoid operation. This is the dual to the copier. <coughs> so I can just feed points to it and get new points. This drawing has got no input, so it's a new point. So this is what I'm defining as my circle dot operation. And because I know that it's a commutative monoid at this level, that I have all the equations to make these guys into a commutative monoid. And this green dot is the commutative <coughs> point. But that's the less interesting thing you can do with this operation. The more interesting thing is only to give it one input. And now I've got a map. This is some kind of linear map, which is defined by this copying of this, um, this monoid operation and this state. So I'm going to write it like that. And again, because of this, this guy here has such nice properties, I know that this, this map I define will commute with the copying operation, uh, sorry, co-copying, and it will commute with other examples of itself. And you have these equations satisfied here. Okay, so whenever I have a, whenever I have a state and a class of structure, I can make maps. That's why I call it lambda, kind of a, like a lambda listing or something. Okay, but now I know that, I can have a more complicated graph with some random stuff joined onto it, and I can still have my spider theorem, except in the middle, I'm going to sum up all the guys that I had in the graph with this operation on the plane. Okay. So, come back to the unbiased points. If I give you this guy, when is it unitary? So you can, it doesn't take very much effort to work out what this is as a matrix, and then you can prove that if you're working in Hilbert spaces, this operation here, lambda psi, is unitary if and only if psi is unbasis, un sorry, unbiased in the basis that delta copies. So this is a definition of unitary that doesn't depend on actually doing inner, sorry, definition of unbiased. It doesn't depend on doing inner products. Okay, and so I'm going to call my unbiased point alpha. So I have him in here. That's his adjoint. That turns out to be equal to the identity if he's unitary. And so I'm just going to write it like that in my notation, and then I know that this guy should be minus, because he's the inverse, he's the adjoint of unitary map, so he's the inverse, so this guy's sum to zero. And so what you get now is a small result which says that the unbiased points are in a Boolean group with respect to this operation. And the arrows, these guys, generate the unbiased points, are also in a Boolean group with respect to composition of arrows. Let's have a picture to make this a bit more clear. So this is the block sphere that Key was talking about in this talk. At the top and bottom of my, my classical points. And 
I'm going to denote them like that for reasons that will become clear shortly. And the unbiased points are just the equator of this sphere. And if you look at these, you compute what they are, they're all equal superpositions with some phase here. And I'm going to write it like that as well. And the matrix that you work out for this particular example is just the usual rotations in Z phase. Okay. Okay, so now I want to have two of these things. And I want them not just to be um, classical structures, I want them to obey some certain relations. So here's some examples. This is what I'm just talking about. And this is the one that copies the, the X phase, it's the plus minus states, and it erases by projecting zero up to infinity one. So one of the equations I want. I want to say, whenever green can copy a red point, then that point should be an unbiased point for the red structure. And then I want to say, whenever red can copy a green point, that one should be an unbiased point. I mean, it should give rise to a unitary map. And finally, I want the green dot to be one of the points that gets copied by red, and the red dot with nothing in it to be one of the points that gets copied by green. Okay? And this defines the complementary classical structures. And so in the block sphere picture, this is the picture we had a minute ago. Here's my unbiased points for green. And all I want to do is add another look here and say, okay, here are my unbiased points for red, and now the classical points for that are, are these as the books here. Okay, and here's the theorem. If you've got two of these things, then they form bialgebra which means this equation is satisfied. There's a small technical condition about having enough points to do this. Okay, so that's, that's what we call the biology for law, and having that with these two guys, say you can copy who, makes this into a biology. In fact, you can make it something stronger, you can say it proves it's actually half algebra, so you have this configuration, you can rewrite it into this one, here, it's quite short. Okay. So that's the first point of structure we have. The next thing we have is interference effects. So I'm going to go through a couple quickly. So what I want to know is, is this, if I've got two classical points for red, so two points for red and I multiply them, is it still a classical point? The answer is yes. And so you can prove, using biological law, that this is copying these things. So classical points form something. Okay. And furthermore, if I have the maps generated by them, they're going to commute with, with this guy for reasons which I'm not going to show you. Okay. And this gives you a theorem which says that if I have a point, if I have an unbiased point for green, and I act on it with one of these classical classical maps for red, then that's a group symmetry. Okay. So this is still, this is showing that he's still unitary. Okay, another one can come through. They cancel because they're adjoints. The whole green bit is a definition of unbiased, so it goes away and they cancel. Okay. And there's some more equations to be proved, but it's it's all like that basis. Okay. So that's that's so this is the point. I've got an automorphism of this group of phases. Right? Okay, so now let's say it's in qubits. Let's try to get uh, precise now. So what do we have? We've got the Classical basis defined by the x and z observables. The unbiased group is just a unit circle under addition of angles. The classical group is just a two-point group. And the action of this group on this group is to send alpha to its negation. Okay. And the final detail in the case of qubits is we're going to have an extra piece of structure, the Hadamard map, which will map one structure onto the other. It looks like this. Okay. Yellow box. It squares the identity. And uh, whenever I've got a red thing, the same thing as a green thing, surrounded by bonds. Okay? Uh, we're going to use these equations quite a lot in our examples. Okay, so here's the first example. This is the C0 gate from one of the basic quantum logic gates. This one is the control, this one is the target. Can I prove this to you? Okay, suppose I feed in a bit like this. This is the bit zero. Uh, if I put it through here, I know it should be copied. So it goes through there, and on the left, I know that that's it's the identity, so that goes away. So control does nothing, and the qubit in its input is low. It's if I put in pi, this is the qubit 1, it comes in here. It also gets copied because it's classical. So now I'm acting with, a, uh, with an excitation of pi on this side. So I'm doing, I'm doing a, a knot on that bit. Oh, 
There's a glitch there that should be fired. Though. So in these pictures, what if you put in like something which is not diagonal in, your, in, in, in the computation basis, and neither in the X basis nor in the Z basis? What, how do you represent these things? Like how, how does it look like? There's something which is in a state which is sort of <coughs> a pure state which is neither uh, an eigenstate of X nor Z. So how, how no, does no, it look you give like it by its Euler decomposition. Sorry? You can give it by its Euler kind of rotation. So I mean, I can write down something at any angle. The only thing, it's not in a, if it's not in the computational basis, then this copying law won't hold for this color. That's the thing. So you can't do all these kind of rewrites arbitrarily. Only in some nice cases. You can do these rules only from certain states. If you know, if you're That's promised right. that you get certain states. Only, only the, only the basis states can be copied. Yeah. Okay. So now I have to do this again. Okay. So here's an example from uh, Professor Grushka's textbook on quantum computing. Three C nodes in a row should be equal to the swap. Can we prove this? I'll go very fast, so pay attention. Okay, did you see it? But I used essentially the bi-algebra structure there, nothing else. Okay, let's try another one. Here's the CZ gate. Now, you know that this is the CZ gate. If you believe me before, it was the C naught, this one was red. I can put two H's here, just by doing that, and then this will change the color and the H will come in here. Okay, so that's the CZ, and I can prove that it squares to the identity. Yeah, that's the Hopf law, it's appeared by spider law, it goes in there. So that's the identity. Ah, and my example from earlier. So now I know what the, the control law is, I can get rid of that box. So I can draw it properly. And so now I'm going to prepare the bell state. Okay, so use my spider law and uh, that goes away. My red one goes through the edge and it becomes green. <coughs> my green one goes in there and it goes away. So it's the bell state. A more complicated state. This is one dimensional cluster state. So, in measurement based quantum computing, we work, build things by building up very complicated graphs and tangled qubits and then reducing them through measurements. Okay, so this is how you start by building up the state. Here's some qubits prepared in plus. Here's a bunch of CZ operations. This is going to give you a chain. Alternatively, you can prepare this thing by preparing some, some Bell states, or Bell states multiplied by H, and then fusing them together. This is the PEX. Okay, so, but you can see that these things are, oops. you can see that if I use my spider law, all these dots collapse together, and you get this, and then to get to the PEPS one, I'll just bend these lines a bit, which I'm allowed to do because they're the same graph, and so they're equal. So these two methods of producing the cluster states are equivalent. A more complicated example, I can compute a one qubit rotation by an arbitrary unitary. This is three, uh, sorry, four qubits compared to plus. Here's an input. Here's four projections in, in the, with angles <coughs> gamma, beta, alpha, and zero. And here's my CNOX making up the, the stick. So I take the boxes away. Here's my spider law, the law collapses. I can remove those two green dots at the end because they're just one in, one out. And now the two H's square together. Now I have the green thing surrounded by H's so it can be red. And now I prove this measurement pattern is really computing the Z rotation and X rotation and the Z rotation. And the last example, quantum Fourier transform. So here's the circuit for the quantum Fourier transform, and here's this input. So I'm going to simulate it on this input. Okay. So I take away the boxes. That was the copy. So this one's going to go in, into that green one to be copied. So this is a this is a classical control bit, if you like. And now it's going to turn on that that base shift down the bottom. So the red dot on the left becomes green. It goes through pi, but it doesn't change because its angle is zero. It picks up pi, minus pi by four from that, that thing there. Then it goes to the other. It goes to the pi again. But remember, I've got my interference effect, so its angle will change to positive pi by four. Those add up. And the other one changes color. And so what we did was we took the bit string which was coded here and put it into the phases over here. Okay, so this is the interference. So that's all I wanted to tell you about today. So what we've kind of shown is that if you have a pair of complementary observables, you get Hopf algebra, or something which is close to Hopf algebra except for a scalar factor. And then we have two groups which are defined by this, the classical points and the unbiased points. 
uh, you have some interference from one group like the other. Uh, unlike my structural equations, we can actually do some real work with these, with these equations that I showed you. So there's some ongoing work which is to investigate multipartite entanglement, algorithmic properties of measurement based quantum computing, some toy models for quantum mechanics, and a little bit of work to clean up the theory and get rid of these kind of markets. Secondly, I'm doing some work with um, people in Edinburgh and Oxford to build a tool based on this. So here's a little bit of its output. So this is constructing a graph and as you go along. And so the questions in this direction are what are the nice rewriting properties of this language and how expressive can we make this language by adding things like patterns or variable binding and so on. Okay, I think. So people who wrote the papers I was talking about were these guys, some of them are here. Okay, thank you very much. So there was a question uh, in the middle of your talk about what to do if the um, things you're working with don't come in, in a given basic state. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? You decompose them into the... So you mean it is a representation, you can represent them by just rotations in the two planes. Um, but in terms of any equations you have, you just have less equations in that case. So you might be, I mean, you wouldn't expect to be given a big arbitrarily entangled state and be able to break it down into the qubits. So you want that to happen. So you've got two, your main primitives are your spider law and your, your classical ones. So you can do a lot of work to reduce things to normal form, but in general you're going to get some arbitrary two-colored graph with some, some annotations in the middle. So if there are no more questions, let's thank uh, Ross again.